Is the SEC clear enough or not today? Nancy, I want to have you take the first shot. Okay, two disclaimers. I'm a former SEC staffer. I love the SEC. They're just the wrong agency to be regulating this industry, in my view. And secondly, I'm not an anarchist. I actually believe in regulation. And I happen to believe in kind of a soft touch in this industry. So is the SEC doing enough? Well, utilizing the bully pulpit, they obviously have expressed very strong views that all cryptocurrencies equal securities. And therefore, they have absolute jurisdiction over the 2,100 tokens out there trading uh, other than Bitcoin, and that fluctuates from day to day whether or not they consider Bitcoin a security or not, uh, and ETH, and, and again, that fluctuates. And that directive only came out of the head of the Division of Corporation Finance saying in a speech that neither of those were securities. So are they doing enough? In my view, no. Uh, they are viewing everything with hindsight. They were aware of the, the ICO uh, craze in 2017. Companies were, in fact, utilizing the Howey analysis, trying to figure out, gee, is this a security or not? And now, in late 2018 and 2019, the SEC, with the benefit of hindsight, is saying, we disagree with your analysis. Mike, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. So I also worked at the SEC. I was there for about eight years in a, a couple of different capacities. And I, I think they, the SEC could do more. But I am, I was, when I was at the SEC, I was impressed um, about how pragmatic and how thoughtful they were about this space. Uh, I started working on blockchain issues. And it wasn't my, my day job when I was at the SEC. I was a sort of a traditional... 40 Act lawyer, but something came across my desk. And so I started getting involved in blockchain in 2014. And around 2014, they formed the Digital Ledger Technology Working Group. I was one of the first uh, of the six members of the original group. And, and at that time, I was just kind of blown away at how, because it was so new back then, but there was fraud. And I was just blown away at how thoughtful and pragmatic and the steps they were taking even back then to get their head around this. And they brought in people from the industry even back then to present to us and to talk to us and to let us interact. Um, could they be doing more? Could they be doing it faster? Yes. It's just not the way the organization works. It's a big ship and it moves slowly. Um, and there's a lot of people in that ship that they need to talk to and sign off on. But I do think that while the, while the framework that was issued uh, three or four weeks ago um, did create additional considerations, I think it was encouraging on some levels. Um, the framework nodded that the SEC was, signaled that the SEC was trying to understand the industry more, and it also showed what factors it was considering, albeit a lot of factors and not a weighting on those factors, but it did show those factors. And the last thing, which is consistent with what they've been saying over the past two or three years is, um, you know, we'd love to have further conversation with you. So. Most people will think the framework was was just another blow. I'm, I'm trying to stay glass half full and that it was encouraging on some levels. What do you think, Rob? You seem to be, you know, do you agree or partially? So I think there's a lot, a lot of areas of agreement and some areas of disagreement, right? I, I don't think there was ever a question that most tokens or virtually all tokens were securities. Uh, I think there was, it was a, a fascinating set of issues in 2017, 2018, e e even continuing on today with some, in some quarters where people thought that, where people were taking the position that tokens were not securities when the SEC was saying they were, when the Howey test was leading to the, uh, to, to, to the essentially necessary conclusion that virtually all of them were. So, so I, we never thought there was an issue, a question about whether tokens were securities. Um, we have thought and continue to think that the real sets of issues from a, from a regulatory perspective are, so now what, right? So 
how do we do a reggae offering? How do we get an ATS up and operating? How do we think about some of the more sophisticated and difficult regulatory issues these present? Transfer agent, broker dealer, clearing agency, Reg M, all of those types of issues. And those are the things that we've been working with the SEC on. I definitely agree with Nancy and Mike that uh, and we were talking about this a little bit before, that one of the things that I think the SEC has done well is try every which way it knows to say, yes, these things are securities and the securities laws apply. What I think they've not done as well at is saying, okay, the securities laws apply, that's what the, that's what it, this is what that means, this is how you move forward, this is how we get crypto out into the public into public hands, this is how we get public trading markets, this is what a regulatory scheme should look like. I think the third layer of that is the notion that we should have congressional action. And I think at some point we should have congressional action. I actually think congressional action needs to happen in two phases. I think the first phase needs to be that Congress has to work, has to give additional authorities to the SEC, to some extent to FinCEN, to the CFTC, to other regulatory agencies to have more authority, to give necessary exemptive relief, necessary uh, sandbox type relief to crypto and similar kinds of projects. I think only after we have a reasonably well-functioning market in the U.S. with actual trading with a number of uh, companies that have gone through appropriate registration processes and the like, then I think we'll all have much more experience and much better a framework from which to figure out how we want to think about not only the securities laws issues, but the, the AML issues, the terrorism issues, the, uh, the, 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 crypt, the, the uh, uh, hacking issues, and all the others that can be presented by, by blockchain. And so I think it's a mistake for people to say we should adopt a, 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 a regulatory scheme that tries to cover the whole waterfront today when we're really still at the infancy of what this technology is probably can do and will become. But Rob, the SEC doesn't feel it needs more authority. Why do we need congressional action then? They feel they have plenary authority to deal with this, as well as exemptions. Well, clearly the SEC doesn't think it has plenary authority, right? It doesn't think that it, 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 gets, it takes out the CFTC. It doesn't think that FinCEN doesn't have a place. It doesn't think the states don't have a place. It doesn't think that uh, state money transmitter laws, that the bit license well, laws, doesn't think that any issues. of those things apply, right? But when, when we say that these things are securities under Howey, Right? The Howey test has been, has been around since the early 40s. These things fit the Howey test. The Howey test has been highly successful uh, throughout, the, throughout its life. It's difficult to see why it is, other than that people didn't necessarily recognize at the outset that these tokens were securities. It's difficult to understand why, ha why securities law is the wrong place to, to regulate this, well, what, why investor protection isn't precisely what we want to have with respect to sales of tokens. Well, if Howie is so clear, why did the SEC have to add 38 new factors? So the SEC's factors, if you look for, first of all, the, the release did very little, or the recent release did very little in terms of expanding on Howie. It really just gave several factors uh, on, on Howie. The, the real interesting question is, uh, is really, when do we reach a decentralized state? When do we reach a place where we can say that the, the tokens are so decentralized that for purposes of Howie, we no longer are relying to a significant extent on the efforts of others, or at least the efforts of identifiable others, in order to generate returns, right? That's, a, that's what the decentralization debate is. That's what a lot of those statements in that release went to. But, but why, do, why would we need to say so many things? Well, remember, how we dealt with a citrus grove. It dealt with interest in a citrus grove. We have literally thousands of cases since Howie, interpreting the Howie test. Howie test has been used for things, not only citrus fruit, but movie tickets. It's been used for oil leases. It's been used for commodity contracts. It's been used for, for, for all sorts of different things. And that's actually the point of Howie, is it's a, it's a, it's a catch-all provision. So of course, cryptocurrency presents different practical issues or different exact issues than a citrus grove. So of course we're going to have different things, and that was what the SEC was a trying to do. A couple of days ago, Valerie, Valerie, two days ago at Consensus, said that to not interpret the, what uh, uh, Hinman said about the decentralization uh, characteristics as a Hinman test. She said specifically, and I quote, there is no Hinman test. There, there, is, there is no such thing. He was just uh, extrapolating on how the Howey test could be 
uh, interpreted in, in today's age. Uh, let's go to, uh, uh, you can comment on it in a second, but uh, Andreas, uh, what's your view from Switzerland? Because um, I mean, you've been involved in a lot of these token offerings and, and there the foundation is the linchpin, it seems, uh, for making this a reality. But what do you think when you see what's going on in the US? Uh, are we crazy here? Uh, I mean, what goes through your mind? He told me he thinks we're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously. I mean, it's, it's a fully outside view. I'm not the one to decide whether it's clear or it's not clear. But <laughs> I, I think from my outside view, it's quite simple. It's now 2019. We started off as token offerings in uh, 2014, more or less, when after the launch of the Ethereum platform. Uh, we now, when we look what happening in Switzerland and other jurisdictions, moving into an industrial phase where we apply token in industrial use cases where there should be. It's not about an funding element. The funding is the beginning. And here in the US, it seems to me, you're still discussing whether a token, all tokens are securities, which has a, quite an effect on, on the use of these tokens for various applications has effect on custody, it has effect on trading, it has effect on in, uh, many industrial use cases. And I think the fact that we are now sitting here and you asked the question, William, at the very beginning of this panel, is it clear what the SEC says? Well, after well, roughly five years' time, it's probably the answer is no, it's not clear, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here. That's the outside view. <laughs> I agree with that. So if it's not clear, what should be the path forward? I mean, nobody's perfect. Um, what, what should be, if you were in the SEC shoes, Nancy, maybe, uh, what, what would you, what do you think we sh they should do? <laughs> Get out of the industry. So. Uh, personally, I would put uh, Hester Peirce in charge, and <laughs> who I think has a much clearer vision of how the area should be regulated. She wants a, in my view, a softer touch. She believes in regulation though, but uh, I would move along in that direction. I wouldn't declare 2100 tokens out there as securities. Uh, I would wouldn't. not Wouldn't. So kind of leave everything behind that's happened and go forward. I would go forward. Yes. And you know, we have clients who are in big fights with the SEC, and we have one, which I missed some of Ted's comments this morning. Uh, you know, we're on a path to fight the SEC really on behalf of the industry. And uh, because the efforts that the SEC has demonstrated thus far uh, in their enforcement actions, uh, the people that they're trying to protect, the token holders, the result of the, inf the enforcement settlements that they've uh, affected uh, caused the tokens to be delisted from the currency exchanges, the foreign currency exchanges, and uh, there's no path for these individuals to actually you know, sell their token, utilize the token. It's just hurting them. So. Uh, I think you're right, going in the direction of let's move forward rather than backwards. Uh, the fact that they disagree with how people analyze the Howey test uh, maybe should not be the criteria that they're using at this point. Can they move forward without uh, the Congress uh, uh, kind of giving them a, a bigger push? I think they can. And, you know, I agree with you that the SEC has taken a lot of time. They've been very generous with their time and bringing people in, having the conversations, but it seemed to stop there. And they never signed off on a project. Uh, you know, the only projects they've signed off on are, you know, the closed loop trading mentality that, you know, they signed off in 1957. And there was really no need for no action relief, the most recent no action relief. So. Uh, you know, I think they just need to broaden their outlook. I think they're concerned as regulators that they're going to miss something, which is why they're taking, you know, the slow roll, so to speak. But we're losing market share. And, you know, it, it's concerning to me. I don't like everything moving offshore. I don't like foreign governments, in effect, taking control over blockchain. 
uh, you know, I want the U.S. to have a role in this industry. So I would like the SEC to have a broader outlook. Rob. I'm not going to get any applause. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't have, we don't have any clients who are fighting with the SEC. Our clients have been working with the SEC. Um, the notion that my clients and my firm's clients who have worked with the SEC, who have recognized that these are securities all along, who have paid attention to the SEC, would be, could be put in a position where a year and a half or two years later, the SEC would say, you know what? We've been saying these things are securities at least since the DAL report. Nobody listened to us. Nobody believed us. We really meant it. But you know what? We're going to give all of you a pass. All of you who didn't pay attention to us, all of you who didn't do the very basic Howey analysis, we're just going to give you a pass. What, what does that say, both to the blockchain clients, blockchain people who've tried to do it right, who, have, who, who are not fighting with the SEC but have been trying to work to the SEC? What a terrible competitive disadvantage. What a terrible regulatory disadvantage that sets up. And what a terrible regulatory message that sets in the future which is that the SEC is setting up a system where if you race to do something at the very beginning and have even a, a, a shred of an argument that the securities laws don't apply, even in the face of SEC comments, you're going to get a waiver. You're going to get, you're going to get a free pass. That's a, that, that can't be the basis of a sound regulatory approach uh, in the U.S., at least, in, at least in our view. Again, I do agree that the SEC could be doing and should be doing a better job of saying what yes steps we can take to move forward, to, to register, to uh, have uh, trading markets and the like. But the notion of waving a wand and saying, you know what, we're giving a free pass to everybody, especially from DAO on, when the industry should have been on notice, I don't, I, Nancy, I don't understand how that works. So first of all, they're doing through, you know, through their enforcement program, they're doing that in effect. They've only targeted certain companies. They're not going after 2,100 tokens. Uh, and for them to take on all of this with, what, 40 people in the crypto space at the SEC, I mean, I don't think they have the manpower to do it. So in effect, they're doing that. What they've tried to do is they went to what I would call the weak links, companies that didn't have enough money to fight them. So it is a very scary call to get. If I can remember the call I got on one of my clients. They said, gee, we heard you were representing X. And I said, oh, how'd you hear that? Oh, the Canadian regulator. Thank you, William. Uh, so they, you know, and said, you know, thank you for the call. We'll get back to you. It's frightening for entrepreneurs to get that call. And, uh, you know, no one wants to think about spending all the money that they have to. One of my clients has spent five and a half million dollars over the course of two years responding to document requests, testimony. Uh, they've had to reimburse, uh, you know, through indemnification of their board members, uh, some of their investors. And it's a lot of money. There's still no lawsuit. And we've been pretty transparent. Uh, you know, there's something called a Wells Notice. You'll get a call from the SEC saying, we're going to sue you. Uh, or we're making a recommendation to the commission that they authorize an enforcement action. Uh, many years ago, there was a process put in place because people who were targeted felt that the commissioners really didn't hear their case. So what you do is you submit a Wells submission and that well submission puts your case forward. So my client elected to make that public. They wanted to be transparent. And they wanted you know, the community to understand why they felt this was so important to the community. Uh, you know, the SEC still hasn't taken action. We're still waiting on that. Uh, but again, Rob, I don't think or I think that they do that in effect anyway. You know, they had this mosaic in mind, so they went after the weaklings. Then they wanted to go after somebody that did a really big offering, big being, you know, $100 million. And then I'm aware of other investigations where there were even larger... 
I, I disagree a little bit. They went up the weak links. I mean, a few of the cases, um, like let's just take Munchie, for example. I mean, the facts were not so good in that case. I, I mean, that was pretty low hanging fruit, like promoting the token, saying it's going to rise in value. I agree. Yeah. So. Andreas, how many people do you know, if you know, does Finma have that are focused on crypto, like roughly? Uh, how, how, many, how many people does, does Finma have that are focused on crypto? Within the within Finma, within Finma, well, I mean, obviously there are many people involved. We have a fintech desk, which is quite small. It's I think there are roughly ten people there. Ten people. And then they, they, they have the different departments where they have different people looking from the banking side, collective investment schemes, uh, AML regulations. I think the advantage of our regulator is uh, it's one regulator for all. So all the financial uh, market. Um, legislation is being supervised by the same entity, so they speak with one voice, which makes mm. processes uh, substantially faster and more clear as well. Um, what, what, what my impression is in the discussion a bit, and obviously I'm not in a position to make any statement of what SEC should do and should not do, but I'm in a position to be able to share what the consequences are in the market, uh, in the uh, ecosystem if you have a regulator who makes a very clear statement. Uh, and I think uh, we had uh, the Swiss regulator in 2018, which was also after a lengthy time of uncertainty, uh, acknowledged the fact that not each of the tokens have the same technical functionality and the same economic functionality. Thus, there needs to be a distinction while the Swiss regulator acknowledges that there are tokens which definitely qualify as securities. It also acknowledges that there are various tokens which are, have uh, not a security function and are not qualified as securities. And once you have this clarity, a whole field of new discussions array, arise and a whole field of new uses of those tokens in a more legal certified uh, or with legal certainty uh, environment develop. So you can provide, you start to provide proper custody solution because custody of securities and custody of a payment element or a utility token type or from a regulatory perspective, different things. And if you don't know what are you doing, because you don't know if this is security or not, you can't provide these services properly. And you would also, what we see now that in Switzerland, and here I'm not going to get an applause, I assume, as well, because it's a rather centralized approach, but what we see uh, that a lot of the large banks are now moving into custody services for, for crypto and digital assets because they now know, okay, what are the regulations for that? And the core banking service providers are integrating those solutions in the core banking services system. So you have the reporting modules, you have the, all the AML modules in place because you know how to do that. And so for me, this decision on what is a token and is really each token a security is quite essential for the development of the rest, which we are all looking at to develop. So I think it would be good to have clarity on that. So Rob, do you think that the Reg A plus is the way forward and as the safest way today? But, and it's, it's expensive. Is it going to, to become less expensive? But, and it doesn't solve everything, right? What, what, what would you recommend? So Reg A plus is a valuable tool. Um, it is expensive right now. Um, it will continue to be expensive for a time. Obviously, costs will come down as we have more and more experience, and especially as the SEC ha has more and more experience. Um, it's not, because of the $50 million limit per uh, e each year, there's a limit to how useful Reg A is going to be, and eventually we're going to have to cross the bridge on uh, doing S1s or IPOs uh, uh, for tokens. Uh, and there, the biggest issue is going to be that will, for, 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 for odd securities law reasons, we're actually going to have to go state by state to get um, each state's approval in addition to the SEC's uh, approval. Um, however, um, if not for many, many platforms do require there to be a continuing distribution of their tokens. It may be to pay oracles, it may to be, be to pay miners, it may be to pay other social, to, to pay for social benefit, socially beneficial use of the system or for other reasons. But as long as we have, the, as long as these things are still securities, if we're paying out tokens for any of those purposes, including mining, those are securities distributions. And either they have to, the, the tokens have to be registered or the tokens need to be 
exempt from registration, which would mean we could only give them, for example, to minors who are, who are accredited, at least in the U.S., who are accredited investors, and those tokens would have to be locked up for a year and a day, which is a particularly lousy way of rewarding minors, right? So, yes, we're going, we're, we're, we're going to have to continue to find uh, appropriate ways to register. Nancy will point out, and Nancy, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but Nancy will likely point out, yes, but Reg A is not at all tailored to crypto offerings, nor is an S1, an IPO, and that's absolutely right, and one of the things that really does need to happen, but again, the SEC needs more experience before they can intelligently adopt new rules and, and like, but it, absolutely we need better forms, Absolutely, we need a better registration process. That's absolutely true. There just isn't enough experience yet. Let's see if there's uh, one or two questions. David, uh, is it possible to uh, go with the microphone? Uh, are there any questions to uh, the panel that are on your mind? And if not, oh, there is a question there at the back. Do, uh, David, do, can you, do you mind uh, throwing the mic to... <laughs> Well, while David is walking, let me ask Rob a question. So, Rob, I noted, uh -oh. in, I noted in the 1A that uh, uh, your firm took tokens, or you bought tokens, uh, whatever format that was. Uh, what are you guys going to do with them? We have bought uh, our um, uh, venture fund fund, not the firm itself, okay. right, just, just, just like yours, right, um, does hold some tokens, and we anticipate that over time it may hold additional tokens, and when those tokens become freely tradable, and when there's a market in which we can trade them, or which we can reasonably sell them, we will, right, that's just, just like any other private security, but, but you could ask the same question of didn't you, didn't your, didn't Wilson Sonsini's venture fund invest in a whole host of its clients last year, just like Cooley's did? Absolutely. What are we going to do with them? Well, when there's a liquidity event for them. So you're not we'll, going to we'll utilize them. them within the network? Right. I, I'm not aware that our investment fund any, is, intending to be, uh, is intending to use them on a... Uh, Andreas, do, do you take tokens from some of the clients, if you like it? Um, rarely. Rarely? Rarely, yes. Just for, uh, we have done that in various occasions where we really trusted in the project and believed that's a good thing. But uh, normally, we take Ether and Bitcoin as payment that we do. That was a good uh, decision. <laughs> well, okay. Hi. Um, hi, Vinny yes, Langer. Yes, question. Vinny Langer from Civic. Hi. I, I have a question around accredited investor status in the US. I'm obviously South African born and I don't have the, you know, the background to why it's in place. It seems like a very arcane old way of looking at, you know, nannying people and, and you know, and, and, and the, the credit investor checks, that when, what I've seen so far in terms of uh, the implications, it's really implying that you need to have money in order to be educated or, or, or at least financially literate. And, and having come from Africa, you know, when I, when I came to the U.S., I didn't have, I was not an accredited investor, uh, especially with the RAND's weak position against the dollar, so I wouldn't have qualified as, as one either. So all, all I'm trying to understand is when we're trying to position tokens and in the US as securities, and by definition, investment contracts, et cetera, and we're trying to say that only people who have money are smart enough to understand what that means, I think you, 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 it's very short-sighted in that we're positioning um, Americans and the American population against the rest of the world as being, uh, you know, having wealth as an indicator of intelligence, and then what's happening in the rest of the world is countries who see past this uh, accredited investor check thing, uh, they're producing more sensible regulations that are opening it up. And so entrepreneurs who are trying to attract capital from smart money who may not have millions or, or have high income uh, are now setting up in Switzerland or Singapore or whoever else. And so what's the question? The, the question is, like, what is the purpose of incredible investor checks and why does it exist and how do we get to this point? And do you guys support it? Is there a choice? <laughs> Well, I think uh, with the Reg A Plus, uh, you know, the general public can invest. There are limitations on amounts. Was that imposed by the SEC or? Oh, that was, but that was by Congress, yeah. Okay. Um, but again, our regulations were somewhat paternalistic. We want to try to protect people from themselves, uh, which is how the accredited investor standard kind of developed. 
Uh, there are ways under Reg D where non-accredited investors can obviously invest. Uh, I just don't think at this point many token offerings who are trying to rely on Reg D have you know, gone ahead and taken those investors in, at least not to my knowledge. The thinking is that if you're an accredited investor, you have a, wealth, a level of wealth that you can sustain the risk and you can, sort, and you can fend for yourself. You're sophisticated enough to evaluate uh, a security offering that isn't um, going through the full registration. It's an exempt offering. Okay, one more question, if it's short, please, and then we got to give you a short answer. I promise it's short. Jody Rich from NFT NYC. Hester Pierce was incredibly impressive, in my view, at um, consensus. She was humble, transparent, and then at the Coin Centre dinner, she and Brian from the CFTC told that extraordinary story about frogs and toads. How do we get Hester more power at the SEC? To Nancy, maybe, since you brought her up. Or um, get get if well, if Jay Clayton steps down, get Trump to appoint her as chairman. Okay, I wish we had more time because we could have gone on for uh, longer. Thank you very much to the panelists.